Dear students, after studying this module, you shall be able to know about the different roles of criminal psychologists, offender profiling, stress on police officers, punishment, imprisonment and rehabilitation of the offenders. First, introduction to criminal psychology. The term criminal psychology has been defined in a number of ways. Even today, there is no accepted definition. Two leading criminal psychologists in the UK have defined it as that branch of applied psychology which is concerned with the collection, examination and presentation of evidence for judicial purposes. This was given by Good Johnson and Harvard in 1998. It would seem from this explanation that criminal psychology is concerned with investigative those to do with the police and court processes. A wider definition describes criminal psychology as any application of psychological knowledge or methods to a task faced by the legal system. This was given by Reitzman in 2001. This more inclusive definition involves the whole of the legal system. In 1981, Professor Lionel Howard, one of the UK's founding fathers of criminal psychology, described four roles that psychologists may perform when they become professionally involved in criminal proceedings. They are first as clinical. In this situation, the psychologist will usually be involved in the assessment of an individual in order to provide a clinical judgment. The psychologist could use interviews, assessment tools or psychometric tests that is special questionnaires to aid in his or her assessment. Second is experimental. This involves the psychologist performing the search in order to inform a case. This can involve carrying out experimental tests in order to illustrate a point or provide further information to the courts. For example, how likely it is that someone can correctly identify an object in the hand of an individual from a distance of 100 meters at twilight. Third is actuarial. In this instance, the word actuarial relates to the use of statistics in order to inform a case. One example of how a psychologist may act in an actuarial role is if they are required to present actuarial information relating to the probability of an event occurring to the court. Fourth is advisory. In this role, the psychologist may provide advice to the police about how to proceed with an investigation. For example, an offender's profile could inform the investigation or advice could be provided about how best to interview a particular suspect. Alternatively, a prosecution or defense lawyer may ask for advice on how best to cross-examine a vulnerable witness or another expert witness. The role of a psychologist in criminal investigations can take a variety of forms. Crime analysis, sometimes also called as intelligence analysis, is one field work which draws upon criminal psychological methods. Crime analysts are generally employed by the police or policing agencies. For example, in the UK, the National Crime and Operations Faculty and the National Crime Squad. In order to analyze crime data to aid the police carry out their roles. One of the most common roles of crime analysts is that of case linkage. This process involves the linkage of crimes based on the similarities in the behaviors of the offender as reported by the victim or as inferred from the crime scene. Next is offender profiling. Offender profiling is typically used with crimes where the offender's identity is unknown and with serious types of crime such as murder or rape. Profilers also work on crime series, which are a series or a collection of crimes that are thought to have been committed by the same offender. The different types of offender profiling are, first is geographical profiling and second is profiling personal characteristics. First, 
geographical profiling. Geographical profiling is used to identify the likely area of an offender's residence from the location of the crime. The criminological principle that is used in geographical profiling is the rational choice theory, which predicts the offenders will engage in a cost-benefit analysis when deciding where to do the offense. When deciding whether to travel to obtain a target object, the criminals will weigh up the costs. Example, the effort of travel with the benefits. Example, how much they desire the object. A commercial robber might therefore be prepared to travel further to commit a robbery with higher financial rewards. A rapist whose sexual fantasies relate to a particular type of victim might be prepared to travel further to seek out such a victim. Geographical profiling suggests that criminals will offend in an area with which they are familiar. In other words, while criminals are going about their daily life, they will notice potential targets. A burglar might therefore notice that a family is going on holiday and to target that house in their absence. The area with which criminals are familiar and which surrounds their residence has been called the home range, while the area in which they commit crimes has been called the criminal range. Second is profiling personal characteristics. The profiling of someone's personal characteristics is more commonly associated with offender profiling and it is the practice that is most often portrayed in the media. The types of characteristics profiled as shown in the media and in the published reports of profiling include demographic characteristics such as an offender's gender, age, ethnicity, educational and employment history. This approach assumes that the way a crime is committed is related to the characteristics of the person, which enables the profiler to draw inferences about the characteristics of a criminal from the way in which he or she behave during the crime. The different types of profiling are, first is statistical profiling. This approach generates statistical relationships between actions displayed at crime scenes and offender characteristics and is carried out through large-scale databases of solved crimes. B. Clinical profiling. Clinical profilers develop their inferences about an offender's characteristics from their clinical experience of working with apprehended offenders rather than using databases of offenses. C. Federal Bureau of Investigation, that is FBI in USA. On the basis of interviews with serial offenders, FBI profilers have developed typologies of offenders that are thought to differ in their offending behavior and therefore in their characteristics. This approach relies on the accounts of apprehended offenders for the development of inferences. Next is policing. Every day, the police service is involved in a large range of activities, ranging from fairly trivial tasks such as giving directions to dealing with serious road accidents, reporting deaths to loved ones and investigating crime. It could be argued that much of what the police do on a daily basis is in fact unrelated to crime. It is not surprising that the stress experienced by police officers has become the subject of research. For the policing role requires that they deal with difficult situations and investigations sometimes in highly dangerous and unpredictable circumstances. The effects of these stresses for a long period of time can cause serious effects, some of them being medical problems, alcohol problems, marital problems and family breakdowns. Police work is definitely stressful, but that doesn't mean that the officer will always suffer because of it. It has been found out that not all the officers experience the same type or same level of stress. It is also found out that different ranks of officers have different causes of stress. Minority groups within the police service such as women or members of any ethnic group can experience stress through discrimination 
from members of the public or within the same working organization. Research shows that the most common coping strategy for stress followed by the police officers is by talking to fellow officers or colleagues. It is also found out that only a certain amount of people are attracted towards working in the police service. Next is interviewing suspects and witnesses. Confessions tend to be a key element in serving justice. Now there are two important drawbacks of confessions. They being A. False confessions, innocent people confessing to crimes they have not committed and B. Guilty people might confess but if the police do not gather any evidence against them, there is a little besides that the court can use against them. Many countries have taken steps to improve the interviewing of the witness, especially A. Those who may have been victims of serious crimes, B. Those who need most help to remember accurately. Researchers from several countries has seemed to agree on the fact that interviewing a witness should include a series of sequential phases that could be described as first established rapport, two obtain free recall, three ask appropriate questions and four achieve closure. Following these phases makes it easier and clears that in order to assist the witness to tell the interviewers about what may have happened. The interviewer must develop a good relationship between him and the witness. Another body of psychological research has demonstrated that when people are remembering events, what they say in their own words is more accurate than what they say when they are questioned about the same. Thus, good interviewing first allows witnesses to provide free recall before asking them any questions. In questioning, it is advised that open questions should be asked first, then specific questions, then closed questions and preferably no leading questions. Open questions invite the interviewee to provide information additional to that given in their free call. Specific questions focus on detail. Closed questions consist a list of alternatives but they may sometimes provide an incorrect amount of information. Criminal courts are one of the places where the questioning of the witnesses, victims and suspects takes place. Next is detecting deception from behavioral clues. It is commonly believed that liars look less in the eye, move their hands and feet more, shift their body positions more, are restless gesture more and touch their body more. This behavior is experienced when the person is nervous. It is believed that many of the people experience emotions too. Innocent suspects may become emotional and it takes them more efforts to think when being asked by the police. Seen more when the interviews are forceful or aggressive. When a person is emotional, it is generally difficult to remember things. Whereas some criminals might not be emotional during their interviews. It is often believed that police officers are perfect at detecting deception. This is so because when a person is lying as compared to telling the truth, people show a growth in certain behaviors, while other people show decrease or no change in the behavior. Many people while lying try hard not to give off any clues that they believe people are looking for. It therefore becomes important that the lies of the suspect to be detected by the police officers. Certain approaches towards detection of deception are first is reality monitoring. This approach to detecting deception is based on the belief that memories based on experienced events can be differentiated from the memories that are based on imagining thinking and reasoning. In simple words, it means that memories for actually what happened somewhat different from made up stories. True memories contain valid information and lies contain many more thought process. Second is computer analysis. The analysis of speech to detect deception includes the use of various computer software 
to analyze different written transcripts of people had said. The software allocates every spoken to a category that may be linked to lying or truth telling. Similar to reality monitoring, it can also assign the words to linguistic categories such as negative emotions and first person singular. This software is at its developmental stages and has a bit of a higher error rate. Third is polygraph. Polygraph is a set of instrument used to measure different variables like the internal bodily actions such as blood pressure, heart rate, respiration and sweating of the palm. It is believed that lying is accompanied by changes in internal activities in the blood. This is detected by the polygraph instrument. This instrument has proven a success in lie detection. Some countries have been using the polygraph test to determine who within the organization or wishing to join the organization is a threat. Next is voice stress analysis. It is found that certain features speaking can relate to lying. The increases in the voice pitch may be small and difficult to detect with the human ear. There has been a development in the equipment that can accurately record this minute changes in the pitch. Such apparatus or equipment is referred to as voice stress analyzers. The problems related to voice stress analysis are same as that of the polygraph. Innocent and truthful people might be stressed and thus their voice pitch rises whereas skilled liars might not be stressed. Next is eyewitness testimony. Eyewitness testimony refers to the information shared by the people who have witnessed a particular event. They may be asked to describe the crime scene they have seen. This involves the details of the crime scene, identification of the criminal and so on. The importance of eyewitness testimony has grown because of the concern that has come related to false convictions. The recollection of information is supposed to be detailed but this is not the case every time. This recollection of information is used as an evidence to illustrate what has happened at the crime scene from a witness point of view. Memories and individual perceptions are considered unreliable along with being easily manipulated, biased or even altered. For this reason, many countries are changing the way eyewitness testimony is presented in the court. Next is forensic linguistics. Forensic linguists share many common areas of interest with forensic psychologists. Forensic linguistic limits it to understanding the language of the judicial processes followed by the court. Sometimes it can be involved in giving evidences in the court. For example, a linguist may argue that without an interpreter, the person to be convicted was unsafe and his rights were violated. Forensic linguists tend to believe that there is no such thing as a linguistic fingerprint. Technical acoustic analysis sometimes proves useful in forensic identification of evidence. There are two types of linguistic evidence. First, evidence of linguistic competence. Can the speaker understand and respond to the court procedures sufficiently? Second, evidence of identification. Did the person say or write this? Forensic linguists also have an academic interest in knowing how the courtroom works. They perform analysis of courtroom questioning by lawyers. Of the witness language and the judge's language in their ruling and the judge's instructions to juries. Through this language analysis, it can be understood how the power works in the courtroom of how the witness respond to certain types of questions and what factors are to be considered that can confuse or inform the juries. The modification of legal language is not restricted to courtroom situations. Forensic linguists study the nature of the legal language and also try to understand why legal language is as it is. The legal and judicial systems often depend upon language 
and these experts in language apply their methods, practices and knowledge to assist, criticize and attempt reforms. On the other hand, there is a very little linguistic work done on offenders. Next is punishment of offenders. Punishment includes some sort of discomfort or pain and takes different forms like psychological, financial, physical or emotional suffering. One of the important features of punishment is its use concerning crime changes across time and cultures. Punishment that was given 20 years ago might be considered as outdated. Punishment is a constantly evolving feature of the society and is related to the thoughts of safety, how effective the judicial system is and emotional responses of being victimized. Next is experiencing imprisonment. Many criminal psychologists work within a prison facility where they assess, manage and if required treat offenders during their term with an aim of reducing the chances of re-offending after their release from the prison. These psychologists try to understand about what imprisonment is like with a view of enhancing the rehabilitative efforts. One of the many goals of imprisonment is deterrence. The threat of imprisonment is to discourage prisoners from re-offending and to deter otherwise law-abiding citizens from committing crime. The prison environment is stressful in nature. Being imprisoned causes loss of freedom and loss of self-sufficiency. It is important to make a difference between a sentenced prisoner and a remand prisoner. A remand prisoner have yet to be convicted of the crime. They were imprisoned for and for this reason they have an additional worries about the coming trial and legal representation. The enforced isolation of the prisoners from their social life can cause loneliness. This lack of social environment can act as a stressor to the prisoner and can even make him or her to end his life. Many of the prisoners are a victim of bullying. Sometimes the prisoner might feel the fear of violence by being violent towards other inmates or by injuring themselves. The prison environment also limits the means through which a prisoner can cope up with stress. Next is the rehabilitation of offenders. Criminal psychologists use the psychological techniques to aim at the offender's problem-solving social and personal control skills. They have also been known to be involved in the effectiveness of offending behavior programs. Rehabilitation is the reintegration of a person into the society with the aim to counter the act of offending, also called as criminal recidivism. There are some similar alternatives to imprisonment such as community service, probation orders, and others entailing the guidance that acts like rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is successful when a person is not placed in health-threatening places. He or she enjoys the access to medical care and are protected from others that practice offending when they are able to maintain the social relationships to the outside world, learn new skills to assist themselves with the working file on the outside and so on. Treatment of offenders under the right conditions can help them to rehabilitate and give positive results. We'll conclude this module with summary. Criminal psychologists are defined as any application of psychological knowledge or methods to a task faced by the legal system. The different roles of psychologists are clinical, experimental and advisory. Offender profiling is used to identify the unknown offender. Different types of profiling are geographical profiling and profiling personal characteristics. Criminal psychologists also work with the police officials in the process of stress coping. They also play a major role in interviewing the suspects and witnesses. Criminal psychologists use their expertise to detect the deception 
the offender is trying to perform to hide the truth. Criminal psychologists share a very common area of interest along with forensic linguistics. They also study understanding of the effects of imprisonment, punishment and rehabilitation on the offenders.